11 more stupid photography terms that don't make sense. Hi, and a very warm welcome to episode 169 of the Photography Explained podcast. I'm your host, Rick, and in each episode, I will try to explain one photographic thing to you in plain English in less than 27 minutes-ish without the irrelevant details. I'm a professionally qualified photographer based in England with a lifetime of photographic experience, which I share with you in my podcast. That was the introductory bit. Here is the answery bit. Okay, this is part two, and I've decided to make this a three-parter. Well, there is a lot to cover here, so in this episode, I will cover the next 11, and then I will finish part three with the last ones and some more thoughts. Yeah, sorry, there's more thoughts. So, strap yourselves in for part two of me sorting out the world of photography so it makes sense in 2024 and beyond. And again, I will come up with a more sensible alternative for some of these. So here's the, here's the ones I'm going to go through in this episode, quickly. Depth of field, glass, noise, HDR, hot shoe, telephoto, standard lens, viewfinder, street photography, fisheye lens, focal length. One of the terms that I dislike most is the first one, depth of field. So, depth of field. What is depth of field? Well, I'm not in a field. What are you on about? How deep's the field? Where is the field? Where's the depth? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Shallow depth of field. Where's the shallow bit? Is there a deep bit? You get the point. And for this one, I have the answer. And it's simple. Makes the change. I've said this many times before. Depth of field is the depth of sharpness in a photo. So let's call it depth of sharpness. Yep, you can control the depth of sharpness in a photo using the aperture, focal length, where you and the subject are and where other stuff in a photo is, as in the subject matter and your distance from them and other elements in the composition. The depth of sharpness is such a natural thing to say. Clever use of depth of sharpness can significantly improve a photo. Depth of sharpness, one term fixed. And we're not losing anything by not having depth of field, are we? So that's a nice, simple one sorted. So now I'm going to move on to a term I can't fix. I'm just campaigning for its immediate and permanent removal. Glass. Yes, glass. I hate this term. Now, glass is what some people call lenses. Why? I mean, yeah, they've got glass in them, but they've also got other stuff in them. I might as well call my Canon 6D metal alloy. Or my phone, titanium. Yeah, I've got a new iPhone 15. Lucky me, I know. Or I could call my house brick, concrete, wood. Doesn't make sense, does it, glass? I mean, glass is glass and the lens is a lens. End of. What's wrong with the term lens anyway? And the irony is, lens is shorter than glass, so you're hardly saving any time or effort, are you? Just saying. Next, noise. Noise. Noise is digital bad stuff. That's what I call it. Noise is silent, which is why I have an argument with this term. Now, you will find, and I, I, this, is, this is true, this, and I empathise with the guy who wrote this, You'll find articles where people tell tales of thinking that higher ISOs made digital cameras noisier. That's noisier as in not to be used in museums. Now, I completely get that. It's a perfectly logical conclusion for the term noise. So I've heard this before. People thought that's what it meant because that's what the term's saying. So it's not their fault. I completely and utterly sympathise with you. So noise is another excellent example of a lousy photography term. So what is noise then? Well, photographically, it's been defined as a random variation in the image signal. What does that mean? But what does noise look like? Noise appears as unwelcome grainy, blotchy or speckled areas in a photo. Noise is commonly caused by high air... I... <laughs> by high ISO settings. You would have thought I could say high ISO settings by now, wouldn't you? Noise is commonly caused by high ISO settings. Check out the last episode for my ISO rant. Remembering that anything other than the native ISO is an amplification of the signal and an electronic amplification of the signal, which can't be good, can it? So it makes sense that the higher the ISO, the more the amplification of the signal. Said it right that time the more noise, or whatever you want to call it. 
It's also a problem sometimes in low light and in particular when you're using a smaller sensor in low light. I don't know. For me, the term noise, it, it would be used for something sound related, not random variations in a digital signal that you're looking at and can't hear. And now I'm happy with digital bad stuff that does it for me. And if you stick to the ISO setting that your camera manufacturer recommended, it won't be a problem anyway, so you can get rid of the problem so we don't need to bother with the term. Sorted. HDR, high dynamic range. Now, HDR was a thing done badly in the early days of digital photography. It's the old, um, really grungy, over-processed photos, and the photographers who did it should really take a good long look at themselves, because what were they thinking? I was one of them. <laughs> I did it and I used to love it. The effects you got, the the horrendous looking back on them now. But it was all part of my learning process. So Rick, take a good look at yourself. I'm doing that right now and it's it's not a pleasant sight, I can assure you. HDR is when you take more than one photo with different exposures and you merge them together in editing software. It gives more light and more dark than you can get in a single digital image capture. But it's not high dynamic range. It's a broader, wider dynamic range. Dynamic range is the range of tones from light to dark, by the way. And to put this in perspective, my Canon 6D has got a dynamic range of about 10 stops. Stops is in the next episode. The average human has a dynamic range of about 20 stops. I should say the average human eye, shouldn't it? Not the average human. <laughs> oh, dear me. So, <laughs> so what you can see with your eyes is about 20 stops range of light. And with my Canon 6D, I can capture half of it. So this means my Canon 6D can capture half of the range of brightness that I can see. That's half the amount of light. Yet my camera sensor is nowhere near as good as my own eyes. Now, there's another way of doing HDR, which is called auto exposure bracketing. And here's the rub. If you do HDR, people will um, will criticise you at best. If you um, if you use auto exposure bracketing, then you're being smart and you're doing a, a clever thing. But they are the same thing. Now you can get hung up here. There are people who say that auto exposure bracketing is the taking of the photos and that the HDR is the processing part of things. But this doesn't really make sense either. And getting back to the oh, just hit my microphone. And getting back to the point, as I've gone on a bit on this one, the term HDR, high dynamic range, it does not make sense to me. A high dynamic range would be, I don't know, more of the bright bits? I don't know. It, like I say, there's no real logic to it. And one more thing I want to say here is auto exposure bracketing. Let's call it that so people don't criticize me. This is where you take one photo, the correct exposure. You take another photo, two stops overexposed, and another photo, two stops underexposed. So in theory, you're getting the 10 stops that you can get with a single image plus two stops either end. That's another four stops. That's another 40% of the lights and darks. Now, how can that be a bad thing? Now, I know it's not that simple. It's not 40% more, but it's more. It's... It's a good step towards getting a bit more than you can see, but not all of it, obviously. Move on, Rick. That last bit was an ad lib, by the way. I hope you can't tell. <laughs> I can't look at this without laughing. <laughs> Hot shoe. It's the thing on your camera that you put your flash into. Not that you should put your flash into the hot shoe anyway, because you'll probably get lousy lighting. Unless you're smart and you've got diffusers and other stuff. No, you don't put a flash gun in the hot shoe and blast with a bare flash gun as you'll get harsh light. But back to the hot shoe, it's it's not a shoe and it's not hot. So I call it a hot shoe. How about, I don't know, flash mount? Makes sense, doesn't it? That's assuming that the word flash is acceptable. No, it's well known in photography that you shouldn't use a flash gun with a flash in the hot shoe and just just saying it annoys me. <laughs> You shouldn't do that without having some kind of diffuser on your flash gun. So why do we even have a hot shoe on a camera? Because you're told, yeah, you spend 300 quid on a flash gun, then you've got to spend another 20 quid on a piece of plastic to put in front of it. I mean, why do we have to do that? Flash guns are hardly cheap, are they? And I'm no expert in flash. That, 
It's an understatement, if ever. But I got so fed up with this a long time ago, that's flash, that is, that I got rid of all my flash guns and I stuck with the natural light or the lights in and around buildings. Now, I'm lucky that the light source I use, it's, it's one of the parts of the building design, so I can happily justify not using additional lights. And then there's flash gun. Hmm. No, it doesn't make sense. It's not a gun, but it does flash. So how about flash? That'd work. Okay, move on, Rick. Telephoto. Well, <laughs> I could be some time with this one too. Okay, wide-angle lens. That makes sense, doesn't it? A lens that gives you a wide angle of view. So, telephoto lens? Well, what does telephoto actually mean? You'll find, you'll find this definition in many places. A telephoto lens is a lens which is shorter than the focal length. Now, I didn't know that. I really didn't. And I don't understand it. And if I did understand it, it's not going to change what I do anyway. And you'll find many references to a telephoto lens with a longer focal length that gives a magnified image with a narrow field of view. That's the bit I'm fine with. The term telephoto, it comes from telephotography, which I nearly didn't say, which I'm quite pleased I got that first time. And this is a technique for photographing distant objects. So whilst the term makes sense, put it with standard lens and wide-angle lens, and it doesn't make that much sense anymore, does it? Standard lens, wide-angle lens, telephoto lens. And that's where things get wrong. And now I don't have an answer for this one. Well, I don't in this episode, but as I'm getting ahead of myself in a, <laughs> in a future episode, I will have an answer. Standard lens. Well, let's take the 50mm focal length. This is a standard focal length, and it's similar to how we humans see the world. A lens with a 50mm focal length is also called a standard lens. And this is the last word on lenses. Standard lens. Well, yeah, it's okay, but... I think standard view would be better. Standard angle doesn't work. So if we've got a wide angle lens, would this be better as wide view lens? Then we can make the tele... Oh, blimey, here is the answer quicker than I expected. And then we could make the telephoto lens narrow view lens. And we're, we're nearly sorted, aren't we? Oh, well, we're getting somewhere a bit better. And this is what you end up with. Fish eye could be ultra wide view. This works for me. And then you get standard view, wide view. Narrow view. Well, it's all about the relative views for me and not the numbers. If we did this, we could ditch focal length altogether. And focal length is one that I'm going to come on to. So if you want complicated, focal length is the place to be. Viewfinder. It used to be called a lens when we had twin lens cameras, and you looked through one lens and took a photo with the other. Then when the mirror was introduced, a single lens reflex camera was born. So, so where did the term viewfinder come from? I don't know is my honest answer. I'm not really sure. It's the find a bit that bothers me. It doesn't make any sense. And with the evolution of digital photography, we now have the electronic viewfinder or EVF. See, viewfinder doesn't make any sense. Or are you, is it helping you to find you? What we're finding? I don't know. I've just had a big alarm come up for um, optimize your PC. So I'm going to have to record this bit again. So where did the term viewfinder come from? I've got no idea. It's the find a bit that bothers me. It just does not make any sense. And with the evolution of digital photography, we now have the electronic viewfinder or EVF. Viewfinder. So what are you trying to do? Is it helping you to find a view? I don't know. It doesn't make sense, does it? Okay. A completely different subject now. Street photography. I hate this term. See, I didn't hate the other ones, but I hate this one. Do you have to be on a street to do it? What about a road, an avenue, a crescent, a drive, a boulevard? I know I'm being pedantic here, but street photography? Why street? Well, <laughs> I know street photography is the photographing of everyday events in public places, but that could be a park. Why is it called street? I've got nothing against it. I just find it an odd term. Fish eye lens. A fisheye lens has a field of view of 100 to 180 degrees. A standard lens, by comparison, 50mm, has a field of view of about 40 degrees. Now, a fisheye has a field of view of up to 360 degrees, but it depends on the fish. <laughs> the, ter the, 
<laughs> and I'm not going to go into the field of view of a tuner over a mackerel or what have you. Because <laughs> I'd be excluding scallops and other things, wouldn't I, which isn't fair, no. <laughs> now, the term was first used to try... The term was first used by someone who was trying to recreate the view of a fish with a camera. So it does make sense. So like I say, fisheye lenses, they're commonly 180 degree field of view, or you can get them with 170 degree field of view. You have to remember that if you take a photo and you just got your camera level, your feet will be in the photo. <laughs> but I guess they were creating what a fish sees. But I've had a little think about that. And how can, how can we possibly know what a fish sees? But hats off to the person who had the creative thought to try to replicate how a fish sees. That is some serious tangential thinking, which I absolutely love. First use of the word tangential, by the way. Tangential. Easy for you to say, Rick. Okay, I might have to let this one go. No, on reflection, no, I'm not going to. Right, plump up the cushions. Get comfy. This is going to take some time. Focal length. This is a bad one. How does the term focal length get turned into an actual dimension? And what does that dimension mean? I don't know what the numbers mean. And i got a camera lens right next to me as I write this. Well, I did have when I wrote the script. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what it means, and let's see if we can pick the bones out of this one. And remember, this is for a full-frame camera, so there's more work to do for any other type of camera other than a full-frame camera. OK, good old Wikipedia. The focal length of an optical system is a measure of how strongly the system converges or diverges light. It is the inverse of the system's optical power. OK. Nikon or Nikon. The focal length of a lens is determined when the lens is focused at infinity. OK. Adobe. See, I've got the big names on this one. The lens's focal length is the optical distance, usually measured in millimetres, from the point where the light meets inside the lens to a, where the <laughs> where the light meets inside the lens to the camera's sensor. Yeah, I was a bit selective with my extracts there, but does this help us to when we're taking photos? It doesn't help me. It might help you. It might just be that I've got a mental block on this, or I'm just not intelligent enough to understand what it means. But it doesn't actually mean anything to me. I've got a 70 to 200 millimetre lens. Now, do I think I'm going to be photographing at 70 millimetres or 87 millimetres or 147 millimetres? I won't go on. Or am I thinking of what I can see in my viewfinder? <laughs> Which I destroyed earlier. So are you using the numbers? Or are you using what you can see? I mean, I tend to use, on a 70 to 200, I either use 70 or 200. I'm not that subtle, really. If the focal length was replaced with a scale that went from, oh, I don't know, 0 to 10, where 0 was 0 millimetres and 10 was 1,000 millimetres, would this work just as well? Or how about if we had two numbers, field of view and magnification? Now, the way I use focal length is this. I use a 17 to 40 millimetre lens for most of my work. I start at 17 millimetres and... I'll take most of the photos, probably 95%, at 17 millimetres. And if I need to zoom in a bit, I do. Do I know what focal length I'm zooming into? Not a clue. I don't know. And I don't care. All I care about is what I'm looking at and the composition. And that's what matters. That's the important thing. I do not know what focal length I'm using when I take these photos, if it's not 17 millimetres. And 17 millimetres as a number is irrelevant. What's relevant is that that's the wildi wi wildest <laughs> that's the widest field of view on that lens. The numbers don't mean anything to me. And then we go to, say, a crop sensor camera, and you've got to apply a crop factor to the focal length. That's one for next episode, not this one. So with a, a Canon crop sensor camera, you have got to multiply the focal length by the crop factor. So 50 mil becomes 80 millimeters, right? Well... No, it's more complicated than that. Of course it's more complicated than that. The focal length hasn't changed. The focal length hasn't changed. The effective focal length has changed because the focal length is a fixed dimension within the lens. So the crop factor is applied to what reaches the sensor, hence the term effective focal length. And this is part of the problem with focal length. It makes, it makes sense in a relative way. Like a lot of these things do on their own, they make sense. The smaller the number, the wider the field of view, etc. 
But when you got crop factors thrown into the mix, it, it makes it even more complicated. It makes the number more confusing. Right, I'm confused, so I'm going to go into the talky bit. Here it is. If you search these terms on the internet, you can find lots of information on them, and lots of that information conflicts and confuses, and that is part of the problem. I've done a bit of research for these three episodes, and I've, been, I've actually been really surprised by some of the information out there. So suppose you're a beginner taking photos with a phone and you want to get into photography. All this info must make photography appear much more complicated than it is or more complicated than you expected it to be, which can't be a good thing. Much more complicated. And much more complicated than it needs to be, for sure. And that starts at the very beginning when you're buying a new camera. You've got mirrorless cameras, digital single lens reflex cameras, then you've got full frame cameras, micro four thirds cameras, crop sensor cameras. What chance do people stand? Then we're chucking interchangeable lenses, wide angle lenses, standard lenses, telephoto lenses. And then we go into, oh, exposure triangle, aspect ratio, white balance, large aperture, wide aperture, small aperture, fast shutter speed, slow shutter speed. And very quickly, it can seem overwhelming. It doesn't have to be, but it's going to seem it if you're taking photos just using your phone, aren't you? Now, I know a lot of these terms have evolved from analog days, but if we want photography to survive and thrive in the age of the camera phone, we do need to do better. Blimey, listen to me, eh? Okay, so what if I use my phone to take photos and not a camera? Well, first off, and not in my script, it's not a surprise to me, because why would you? Why would you go down this complicated route when you don't have to? And now back to the script. You take photos. That's that. Simple. I know many photographic options exist on phones, but you don't have to use any of them. And you certainly don't have all those camera settings, those dials, those buttons, those wheels. And you don't have to worry about manual mode, raw files, chromatic aberration, exposure time, anything else I need to show on in for the search engines. <laughs> Now, I just got a new iPhone 15 Pro. Shock ambition there, wasn't it? Now, I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford one. I know that. And I've just started taking photos. And I'm doing that using the default camera app. And I just take photos. I've deliberately not done any research or installed any fancy apps. I mean, I know I've got some on there already, but I'm not using them. Now, this is a conscious, deliberate thing that I'm trialing. And it's this. Taking photos by pressing the shutter, which on a phone is touching the bit on the screen that's acting like the shutter is. You know what I mean. I'm just using the phone camera as it is with nothing else and just seeing what I get. And some of the stuff has been pretty amazing. What if I use a film camera? Well, it's the same as the last episode, isn't it? Same as with digital, but more straightforward. Same as the last episode, really. I'm not going to repeat myself. It's the same differences from digital and it's more straightforward and in some ways it's better and yeah i still need to get my film camera well <laughs> am i going to get a film camera now i've got an iphone 15 pro mm, looking less likely all of a sudden what do i do well i keep banging on about this stuff don't i i know i do that's what i do but it's all good stuff right isn't it now i use the things that i need to get the best photos that i can Composition and image quality are my priorities. And in episode 166, I told you how I do this and the cunningly titled How I Use This Complicated Photography Stuff to Take Photos. I know I can't believe that was an episode title, but it went down quite well. Professional photographers have learned all this stuff, so we don't need to think about it too much, and that's fine. It's people wanting to get into photography that worries me, because once you've learnt it, it's not that bad. It sounds worse than it is, but there is a lot to learn. And in this day and age, people are just going to, I think they're going to be put off by all this stuff. Right, some thoughts from the last episode. Well, it was the first 11 of these things in episode 168. 31 stupid photography terms that don't make sense anymore, part one. <laughs> I love that title. It's so long and just too long, isn't it? Next episode. The last stupid photography terms and then my plan for the future of photography. And I'm, I'm getting a bit worried about that one because I've not written it yet. Uh, next episode looking good, though, and I'm sure we'll be fine. Ask me a question. 
If you have a question you would like me to answer, the best thing to do is to head over to the podcast website, photographyexplainedpodcast.com forward slash start, where you can find out what to do. And feel free to say hi, and it'd be lovely to hear from you. Okay, I'm done. Well, not too bad, was it? This episode was brought to you by, um, mm, a cheese and pickle sandwich and a bag of salt and vinegar crisps. Washed down with an ice cold diet Pepsi before I settled down in my homemade acoustically cushioned recording emporium. I've been Rick McAvoy. Thanks again very much for listening to my small but perfectly formed podcast, it says here, and for giving me 27 ish minutes of your valuable time. I reckon this episode will be about 25 minutes long after I've edited out the mistakes and other bad stuff. Take care, stay safe. Cheers from me, Rick. <laughs>